Hello, and welcome to part three of this review of Black Panther 2 Wakandan Boogaloo. This video will conclude not only this review, but my coverage of phase four of the MCU. At times, it's felt like trying to clear a blocked toilet with my tongue, so suffice it to say that I'm very much looking forward to the end. I would down an entire bottle of very good scotch in celebration, but to be perfectly honest, I've had to down it already just to suffer through the rest of Wakanda forever. Part 2 covered this film's second act, the summary of which, having rescued Riri Williams from the clutches of the evil Americans, whose CIA stole her magical bullshit vibranium detector machine, though inexplicably left both she and all her plans and schematics in school, the submarine Aztec merpeople then attacked Shuri, Michonne, and Iron Child on a bridge. Their mission was to kill Iron Child, but rather than do that, the freaky fish people instead kidnapped both Shuri and Iron Child and took them back to Otto Gunga. Wherein, Namor, Freaky Fish Guy himself, decided that nobody in the audience had been paying attention when he laid out his supreme goal of remaining hidden from the world, meaning nobody would notice if he randomly pivoted on a dime and set out to nuke the world instead. He presented Shuri with a choice. Wakanda could help the Aztecs in their first strike, or they could refuse to help and be invaded by the Aztecs. They are Aztecs, by the way. I had a few people in my comment section suggesting that they were Mayans. As far as my history of Mesoamerica goes, I'm pretty sure they were Aztecs because they were there when the conquistadors arrived. But anyway, this, the Aztecs threat as explained at length in part two, contains a few problems. Nuking the world is probably not compatible with the goal of remaining hidden from the world. If your goal was to remain hidden from the world, there was ample opportunity to achieve this with a mutual alliance with the Wakandans, who share almost all of your interests, and you could have raised this prospect at your first meeting with the Wakandans, rather than being a Wally and threatening to invade them if they didn't capture the asset, Iron Child, and hand her over for murdering. Freaky Fish Guy had a brilliant opportunity to achieve what we'd have been obliged to call the most powerful alliance in the world in his meeting with Queen Ramonda Valerian, first of her name, at the beginning of the film. Because, as all military strategists would agree, whales plus rhinos beats tanks plus planes. Having missed this chance because he is an idiot, Freaky Fish Guy then invites Shuri to learn to stop worrying and love the bomb. But she says, nah, because as Princess of Wakanda, she cannot allow Iron Child to be killed by the Aztecs. Iron Child is not a Wakandan, and it isn't immediately obvious why Shuri should be so concerned for her, or indeed why Shuri and Michonne took one glance at her from afar earlier in the film and decided to jeopardize the future of their whole country by betraying Freaky Fish Guy to rescue her. Absence of explanation has led some to conclude that this change of heart was born solely of racial solidarity, despite they being African and she being African-American and these being two very different things. Though that would be perfectly in line with the culture's dumb fuck approach to racial questions, and I'd not ruled it out, then again, the MCU's general response to people asking why its stories make no damn sense is, because shut up. I don't think we need to read Nefarious Intent into it at this point. Don't worry though, there'll be plenty of time for Nefarious Intent later in the video. Having failed in his negotiations with Shuri in Otto Gunga, Freaky Fish Guy then tries his luck with Ramonda Valerian, and... Oh, well, hell, with arms like that, he must have been feeling brave. They meet on a beach, and Ramonda threatens to tell Bilbo everything she knows about him, even though she could have done that already, and Freaky Fish Guy wouldn't have known anything about it. Freaky Fish Guy tells her that she's having a fucking laugh, and if she dares tell anyone, he'll kill Shuri and invade Wakanda for good measure. Wakanda, as we learnt in part two, is also threatened by an American invasion. This is the story of a soldier who operates your nation's Patriot Missile Defense Systems. It begins in California, with a little girl raised by two moms. Although I had a fairly typical childhood, took ballet, played violin, I also marched for equality, and then attended UC Davis, where I joined a sorority full of other strong women. Though the film is hazy on this point. The CIA chat destabilization for a few seconds, then they apparently forget what destabilization means, and so they chat military attacks instead. Obviously, the Americans would have lost that encounter, because Wakanda is, in Ramonda's own words, the most powerful nation in the world, despite its standing army being around 300 tribesmen armed with spears and its air force of about four close-range fighters. 
In a fight between an M1 Abrams and a war rhino, my money is on the M1 Abrams. This tension, by the way, between these two strands of setup is never addressed by the film. Wakanda is normally portrayed with a kind of smug superiority next to the backward and primitive Americans, yet the threat by the Americans is posed at times in this film as severe. It has to be more than an inconvenience, otherwise it would provide next to no motive for action but it can't be more than an inconvenience without revealing that the Wakandans really aren't half as strong and brilliant as they keep telling us they are. How can these things be reconciled? Well, you see, it's really quite simple. You just don't ask the questions to begin with. In response to Ramonda's suggestion, Freaky Fish Guy tells her that she can't tell anyone, let alone Bilbo, because if she does, he'll kill Shuri and invade Wakanda. As noted several times across these videos, the invasion part of his plan makes very little sense. Invading very high-profile nations does not aid your goal of remaining hidden. If your goal is no longer to remain hidden, it's not at all apparent what the plan for Global Armageddon is. A joint first strike with the Wakandans was a preferential option. Freaky Fish Guy presents his offer as join us or we will wipe out the world and you'll be first. The capacity to wipe out the world remains either way. Yet knocking out enemies one at a time presents ample opportunity for those enemies to gang up against you. Even a momentary delay can allow time for your enemies to rally, as Vladimir Putin has found out to his cost. And on top of all that, it's not clear how the Aztecs hope to prosecute this war for global domination, given their entire military consists in the main of whales and fish people. They seemingly have no air force, no ground forces, no drones or technology to speak of, no bombs, no bullets and no missiles. By contrast, all the Americans have to do to find and wipe out the Freaky Fish Boys is locate them, which would be fairly easy to accomplish, conscript James Cameron, strap a suicide vest on him, and send him to the bottom of the Atlantic. Jesus, titty fucking. No more subaqueous smurfs of either franchise. Those complications aside, the film attempts to present Ramonda Valerian with a terrible choice, her daughter or her country. But that terrible choice isn't operative anywhere near long enough to actually be a terrible choice, because not much more than a couple of minutes later, Nokia, whom Ramonda recruited to track Shuri down, managed to get all the way down to Talakan and then all the way back out, with Shuri and Iron Child in tow and without anyone spotting them. So Ramonda's problem has been solved within two minutes of it being posed. Superb. When they go back to Wakanda, they are in possession of more than they seem to realize because not only has Nokia rescued both Shuri and Iron Child, but she also knows exactly where Talakan is. Wakanda now has all the cards. They're faced by an enemy who has pointlessly antagonized them and threatened to invade them on several occasions. He wished to remain hidden, he wanted Iron Child killed, he wanted Wakanda's help in a war. Well, the Wakandans now have Iron Child, they don't need to help him in a war, and they can expose him, or they can threaten to do so. Freaky Fish Guy is deep fat fucked at this point. The Wakandans now have the proof they need to convince the Americans that the Aztecs were behind the attack in the Atlantic at the beginning of the film. And and they don't they don't use it. They, they don't even threaten to use it. No attempt at communication was made, either with the Aztecs or the Americans. Instead, there was some pointless ambling about and chatting. Queen Ramonda gave Iron Child a tour of the Wakandan palace, meaning the Wakandans had only themselves to blame when Freaky Fish Guy and a small division of fish people floated, one assumes, all the way up some very long rivers in order to reach the notably landlocked Central African nation of Wakanda to launch a surprise attack. Freaky Fish Guy and his Freaky Fish people had no trouble at all flooding the Wakandan capital and blowing up the throne room with water grenades, which somehow managed to completely fill the very high tower with water right down to its foundations in an instant. Queen Ramonda rescued Iron Child from the submerged depths but died in the attempt. Both she and Iron Child were full of water, but the Wakandan anal beads were only able to shock it out of Iron Child. Everyone is very sad. Freaky Fish Guy threatens to return in a week unless the Wakandans agree to nuke America. Shuri is now queen, and we are up to date. To summarize the summary, Wakanda Forever pays very little attention to the world it's creating, and its plot has only survived thus far, on the assumption the audience would ask about as many questions of it as its writers did, which is to say, none. To summarize the summary of the summary, this is not a good film. But on to Act 3. Shuri is the queen now. I still can't figure out how Succession in Wakanda works. This, I assume, would have been an opportunity for M'Baku to challenge her for the title, but either he's too nice a guy to do that, 
or the writers just kind of forgot that that was a thing. Or else, he's familiar with the MCU meta that guarantees huge, well-built men will lose to girls with all the muscle mass of an emaciated twig, so he doesn't. Incidentally, you'd think there'd be absolutely no reason for a daughter of Wakanda to have a protein deficiency given the abundance of rhino milk they have there, but, well, maybe Shuri is a vegan. Instead, M'Baku asks her what she wants to do next, and she agrees to the Elder's plan to evacuate everyone to the Jabari tribe's lands up in the mountains. Unironically, the exchange between them is reasonably well written. It covers a number of character bases. Shuri's experiences forcing maturity on her, the relationship between tradition, which she traditionally scoffs at, and science, which M'Baku doesn't value. He was my favorite character from the first scene in this film, and he remains so now. Though it should be added as well that the film is doing a decent enough job giving Shuri a character she had hitherto been lacking. It's a big promotion from ancillary figure to leading role, and by and large that transition has been handled sensitively and conveyed about as well as we could reasonably have expected a task made that much more difficult by the fact that she's having to grow into someone else's boots. In this, the film has managed to marry real-life loss with in-universe consequence, just about. It's just a shame the story around her makes distractingly little sense. Back at Bilbo's house, he wakes up to find Selina Meyer in his kitchen, and she turns on Anderson Cooper, thus leaving a CNN anchor in the unusual position of having a large audience. He informs the world that the Queen of Wakanda is dead. But how does he know this? Was he told about it? Why would he have been told about it, given the Wakandans are shown to be aware that evil whitey colonizers in America have been trying to exploit national divisions and weaknesses following T'Challa's death? If they're so worried about the Americans' reaction to his death that they go to diplomatic conflict with America over it, do you really think they'd have been volunteering this kind of information to foreign powers? This, anyway, is President Meyer's chance to segue into interrogating Bilbo and revealing that she has, in fact, been monitoring all of his communications and knows all about the anal beads he has in his drawer. You'll recall that, in part two, Bilbo got in touch with Ramonda directly, having picked up the anal beads from the site of Michonne's first fight with the fish people, which answers one of those questions I raised in the previous video. Why were the CIA not tracking his phone calls? By raising another question in its place. How the fuck did Bilbo not assume that his communications would be tracked? He works for the fucking CIA. They had been out the site for hours before he arrived, and the beads had conveniently been left untouched by the team of professional investigators solely in order for him to find them. We know he's already suspicious of the CIA. He fears they may believe him to be responsible for Shuri and Michonne finding out about Iron Child. But this suspicion cannot be allowed to get in the way of the plot, I guess, so... So yeah, he's, he's just a moron. Kinda makes you wonder how he ever got a job in American intelligence. Ah, fuck it, who am I kidding? He is perfect for that role. Clear blue skies, my dudes. Clear blue skies. Bilbo doubles down on the film's noble savage motif in mounting a moral defense of Wakanda against Selina Meyer's aspersions. He asks what Selina Meyer thinks the Wakandans could be doing given their power and their, as far as he knows, exclusive access to vibranium. He asks what she thinks the US would be doing, were it in an equivalently powerful position, which mightn't be the wisest comparison to make, because the US has lifted more Africans out of poverty than Wakanda ever did, and because it just recapitulates the writer's bizarre orientalist fetish that I have been told frequently that I am a racist for pointing out. We already know from the previous film that there is sentiment in Wakanda that is militaristic, expansionist, and domineering an inconvenience the writers of that film attempted to sidle away from by having its chief proponent bought up and corrupted by evil white decolonizers. Because all bad things done by African warlords can be traced back to colonization generally and the CIA in particular, and the white progressive way of empowering minority groups is to deny that they have any agency or control of their own destinies at all. But if the film is attempting to say, as its writers and their ilk so often do attempt to say, that the Wakandans live in a pacifist idyll because they alone were uncorrupted by evil whitey colonizers and so never thought to levy their vast technological superiority against the rest of the world because, well, hey, why would they? Hmm, against that I raise you all the history of pre and much of the history of post-colonial Africa. This premise only works because Wakanda makes no fucking sense, and the film only invites us to notice its absurdity whenever it chooses to reiterate its dumb fuck undergraduate leftist understanding of the world in praising the Wakandan magical bullshit meteor model. Back in Wakanda, 
Iron Child has decided that she has a mother-daughter relationship with the dead queen, after all, because what, they shared a single short scene together, shortly before Ramonda drowned while several stories up in the air, and so Iron Child pledges to help Wakanda however she can. She is an honorary Wakandan now. Actually, the film has treated her as one from the beginning, which, typically, makes no damn sense. Like agents in The Matrix, all black NPCs in the MCU are potentially Wakandans, they just don't know it yet. For all the good work this film has done with Shuri, it's done nothing at all with Iron Child, making it twice in the last three films that the MCU has attempted to introduce important new female characters by turning them into MacGuffins without any actual character work being done. The premise, that of introducing new characters under the aegis of established heroes and allowing them to grow into the role, is a solid one, but you do actually have to give them character as opposed to merely giving them a use. In Multiverse of Madness it didn't work because Hugo Lina Chavez was stuck in the middle of a whole cavalcade of colourful, unintelligible shite, one which afforded very little time for character work of any kind, the vast majority of which was taken up by Wanda. Chavez was just the thing the hero needed to protect and the villain needed to absorb. Wakanda Forever makes perhaps a little bit more sense than that narratively, but it suffers from a similar problem. Iron Child has been the creator of a MacGuffin, then she's been a bargaining chip MacGuffin herself, and only now, with about half an hour left of the film, have the writers attempted to give her a character relationship with a dead queen who she met once and shared about three minutes of screen time with. Hitherto, they glossed over the relationship building entirely, first by having her make a situationally inappropriate joke about Michonne's lack of hair, which isn't what I'd have done if a bald-headed demon had turned up in my room and threatened to kidnap me, and then, second, by making her functionally the same as Shuri, which the writers apparently think makes them friends. Because, you know, I write things and make YouTube videos. That automatically makes me friends with anyone else who writes things and makes YouTube videos. I must remember to stop finding Vorsch so utterly fucking contemptible. It would have been hard anyway to introduce Riri Williams in this film, given that we already have, essentially, a brand new protagonist to familiarize ourselves with, not to mention a new villain at the head of a new faction, other formerly shallow ancillary characters to flesh out, and a whole lot of barely comprehensible geopolitical plot to keep track of and about five different potential plots to keep in mind, given how often the writers decide to whimsically flip people's motivations. Multiverse of Madness suggests we're lucky to get even one of these elements done with even a scintilla of care. Shuri is, once again, being developed with something approaching competence, but it still leaves us with two brand new and important characters in the MCU, Chavez and Iron Child, who will essentially have to learn everything about in whatever subsequent installment they appear in next. No character work has been done. I never thought I'd find myself praising Hawkeye, but by comparison with Multiverse of Madness and Wakanda Forever, Kate Bishop's introduction across her first three or four episodes, which I think is a comparable amount of screen time, provides for a much more fulsome introduction to her character, helped by much smaller stakes and a comparative deficit of world-ending bollocks in its plot. Shuri then says that though her brother is dead, it doesn't mean the Black Panther is gone which sentiment might have been better conveyed had the film actually taken time to explain her relationship with the concept, with the Black Panther, beyond merely dismissing it as outdated at the beginning. This is an inversion of her earlier beliefs. But unlike with Freaky Fish Guy, it's not a baseless motivation flip, this one at least fits with her character arc. That being said, we don't get a payoff for it as yet. We don't get anything much about her reasoning, her change of heart, because we go from that sentence to her cutting up the bracelet that Freaky Fish Guy gave her in the second act and incorporating it in the AI's attempt to create a synthetic version of the bullshit goop flower from which they used to derive the bullshit goop, lost to them since the last film and with which she had been trying to save T'Challa at the beginning of this one. She reasons that the bracelet was made from vibranium-infused soil and therefore... Uh, and therefore... That's, that's basically it, yeah, that's what we get. A bracelet, given to Freaky Fish Guy by his mother, then given randomly to Shuri by Freaky Fish Guy, during their entirely coincidental meeting in Talakan, because he conveniently decided in that moment to change his entire goal and philosophy, and so just happened to fancy sounding her out about an intercontinental suicide pact that she didn't actually have to agree to anyway, that she's then allowed to keep, even though she refuses the pact, that was infused with Aztec vibranium, and that therefore unlocks the key to solve the mystery of the bullshit goop. Ha, great. This, this is, this is tenuous at best. The Wakandans still have the vibranium meteor 
that infused the soil there to begin with. And burning all the bullshit flowers in the last film wouldn't have burnt the soil, would it? If a reason was given in that film for the complete extinction of the flowers, as in not just the loss of current stock but the death of the roots, the elimination of any prospect that they might one day grow again, well, I don't remember it and I can't be bothered to go back and check, so I'm not going to advance this as a definite criticism, it's just quite an important question. The film leaves that hanging too, because besides trying to cure cancer, they are also, and simultaneously, trying to work out why Freaky Fish Guy doesn't look like the other fish people. He's not blue, he has no gills, he doesn't require a breather to go above the water, and he has wings on his ankles. He also has no penis, and I'm going to keep pointing that out because it's very funny. It's the middle two of these, though, that they find interesting. Shuri suggesting that some animals absorb oxygen through their skin, like jellyfish. That is actually the example analogy that she gives. Which is unwise, because it sounds very fucking dumb, and it only sounds even more fucking dumb the longer you think about it. We see some Wakandan UFOs airlifting evacuees to M'Baku's lands, which are up in snow and ice-covered mountains. I believe I suggested in part two that this was a tenable plan if M'Baku's lands were a long way indeed from any body of water, because the Aztecs have plot limited, which is to say functionally unlimited, means to control water as we saw when they summoned it out of the ether to flood the Wakandan capital. And yet snow and ice are states of water, so this is probably the last place besides an ocean that I'd have wanted to be evacuated to. Do they not have a desert? Oh wait, they do? Oh, well, well we're gonna come to that. Meanwhile, in the lab, Shuri and Iron Child decide that Fishman gets strong because oxygen. The oxygen comes from the water on his skin, so if they can dehydrate him, they might be able to beat him. So they want to turn a fighter plane into a pervaporation chamber. Yes, you did hear that correctly. They want to turn an aeroplane into a flying microwave in order to dry his skin. Some people in my comment section have quipped that drying someone's back is super effective against a Mexican villain, which I'm obliged to condemn. <laughs> no, no, really, that's... That's very offensive. Bad comment section. Go think about what you did. To make it doubly hilarious, Shuri comes up with this instantaneously. I mean, they don't even cycle through a number of other means by which they might hope to dry him out. Her instant thing is, oh, he can get weak if we dry his skin. Let's turn an aeroplane into an oven. How do you even begin to assess the merits of this plan? The dude gets... Oxygen from the- uh, no. You know what, I don't care. I've spent too many hours being pervaporated by this film, so evidently their stupid fucking plan has some merit to it. Yes, yes, it's actually perfectly clever and practical. Your enemy is a jellyfish with wings, so you have to catch him in a flying oven to dry him out and beat him. Wonderful. <laughs> we get some more Iron Child backstory, and I use the word backstory advisedly, she built her first machine when she was three. Her stepdad wanted to build aeroplanes, etc. This is one very small step away from simply having Iron Child turn to the camera and say, My name is Riri Williams, and here are my motivations in this story. There are occasions when doing the minimum amount possible actually emphasizes how little work you're doing, and it can be better to just do nothing. This is one of them. This pivotally important character has no character. So the film gives her a few seconds to make a reality TV style pitch to the voting public. My daddy built engines, and I want to build engines too. Just fuck off. Michonne, you might recall, was blamed by Queen Ramonda for Shuri's kidnapping. I said at the time that this reflected poorly on Ramonda, but that it could actually be used to aid the story. Some of the blame was Michonne's to be sure, but it was Ramonda Valerian who acceded to Shuri's desire to go out on the adventure to begin with. She didn't have to do that, she could have stopped it at any time. As she was fond of reminding us, she was the queen of the most powerful nation in the world. Blaming Michonne for the terrible consequences of her acquiescence could have been used to flesh out both Ramonda and Michonne by giving them a redemption-focused sub-arc. At the time, I fully expected Michonne to go off on her own in a bid to get Shiri back, but, but she didn't, because Ramonda recruited Nokia to do that, because you know she has to be in this film and Michonne just disappears for the middle chunk of it. The ideal payoff to an arc like that 
is for Michonne to go out of her way to win her redemption, but for the redemption to in fact be mutual. Ramonda realizes that she was blaming Michonne for her own mistakes as a mother, and Michonne had been honorable and decent and loyal enough to risk her life to atone for a mistake that was far from entirely her own. And then the two of them reconcile. We didn't get that because Nokia took what I think really should have been Michonne's place in the plot, and I think only because they had to tie her back in in order to bring out more of the Chadwick memorializing stuff, and certainly to set up the end credits scene which really caps that thing off. It's another example of how what the film wants to do for Chadwick is entirely different from what is best for the story it's supposed to be trying to tell. In any case, Ramonda's dead now, so Michonne will never get that redemption. She's never going to win back her honor in the eyes of the woman she served. And you could still do something pretty good with that. You'd have had to have Michonne very clearly torn up by her seemingly eternal failure, pledging to give her life in return for it, then to be redeemed in the end by Shuri as Ramonda's royal and familial successor, finding some worth in herself. But, um, but what do we get instead? Well, Michonne returns to the story at this point. She's back. She's getting no closure in her argument with the queen, and we don't, we don't even address that. She's, she's just back. And that's pretty much it. She appears in the science lab, Shuri tells her that she's built her a new suit and a new spear, and she's going to become the Midnight Angel. Michelle essentially says, nah bro, I'm a civvy now and that name sucks, but Shuri says, bitch you better be ready when I call you, and Michonne's like, ah, fuck it, why not? And um, yeah, that's it. That's, that's all we get. Extraordinary character writing here. You have a film that sells itself, on the severity of its theme, the theme of loss and mourning. You have an opportunity to explore it further here, to deepen it, because Michonne has undergone a traumatic loss of her own, a loss of honor tied to the loss of a monarch that she wasn't around to defend because of her perceived failings. It directly parallels Shuri's own personal experience of the child's death, someone she looked up to, someone she loved, someone she believed she had the skills to protect, yet someone who failed to protect him. The film understands the basic utility of parallels, hence it trying to control C, control V character into Iron Child by just replicating Shuri's skill set and interests. Yet now, in the one scene where the parallel could have been used to drive home the film's theme and its message, in which you could have progressed that theme and message through its secondary as well as its primary cast, the writers either didn't see the point or couldn't be fucked to think about it for more than five seconds. As I've said many times across my videos, Disappointment scales up based on the amount of potential being wasted. There was, as I hope I've shown, significant potential in Michonne's arc here, which makes her arc significantly disappointing. We then learn that Shuri has made more than one new suit, so Michonne recruits Discount Michonne too. I don't know why this is, narratively, because Discount Michonne is a complete redundancy. She affects nothing. She's the cause of nothing. She has no pivotal role in the plot. She's just kind of there. And now, she's going to be another flying super suit person in the tedious final battle that I'm sure the film is leading up to. Meanwhile, Shuri does indeed manage to synthesize the goo flower, and Nokia turns up for a chat because she's still in this film, remember? And she's very impressed that Shuri has found a way to make more goo. Incidentally, if they can synthesize this goo, they can find a way to mass produce the goo. And if they can mass produce the goo, then we've completed the retcon of perhaps the only sensible narrative decision taken in the first Black Panther film, the destruction of the Goo Flowers. That was necessary, as I've explained before, because the existence of the Goo Flowers poses way too many potentially universe-breaking questions. Why wouldn't they just give it to every Wakandan? Why wouldn't they have shared it with the Avengers? Wouldn't the Blue Goo have been just as valuable and sought after as the Vibranium if they hadn't given it to everyone else? If all it takes to grow goo flowers is to infuse the soil with vibranium, wouldn't Howard Stark have been better off planting Cap shield than giving it to Cap, thereby being able to mass-produce goo of unfathomable potential? And if they can mass-produce the goo, and the goo heals everyone of pretty much everything, wouldn't they be able to cure the world's population of the vast majority of known causes of death? And, moreover, be probably the most immoral jerks in history if they didn't do that. Take charging over the odds for insulin that multiply the douchiness by death, cancer, AIDS, malaria, cholera, basically every kind of death besides murder and old age. The existence of the blue goo and the Wakandans' refusal to share it with a suffering world 
makes Martin Shkreli look like Desmond fucking Choo Choo by comparison. Destroying the goo flowers at least closed off this near infinite line of questioning, but now the goo is back. This has unfathomable consequences, so I'm pretty sure we will never address a single one of them again. Shiri takes the goo and goes dream walking where she bumps into Killmonger, who does the we're not so different you and I speech. To the extent that he had any character redemption in his dying under the sunrise end at the first film, Dream Killer has forgotten all of that and basically just justifies all of his actions, which causes Shuri to wake up in annoyance. She's doubly annoyed because she did the ritual and took the goo, but none of her ancestors bothered to turn up. But hey, she has super strength now, and she picks up a Black Panther helmet. The thing that kind of works out universe, albeit slightly clumsily just by Killmonger's insertion, is that the film is trying to play up her teetering on the edge of being consumed by vengeance, and it's, it's a reasonable way of depicting that. It could have been better, but I, I think it by and large does the job. Shuri then arrives by UFO at M'Baku's mountain fortress, dressed in the Black Panther suit, which looks... Uh, cool enough, I guess, even though it takes her some strain then to beat him in an arm wrestle, despite us earlier seeing her punch a mannequin straight through a wall. Mind you, if the bullshit goo only builds on existing strength, then Shuri here probably had to ingest several liters of it just to get up to the strength of your average 14-year-old vegetarian. But hey, we have a new Black Panther now. She gives a stirring speech, laying out Freaky Fish Guy's crimes, murdering the Queen, etc. In fact, the Queen died saving Iron Child, which isn't quite the same thing, and which presents us with a host of questions we probably don't have time to explore in their fullness here, such as why the Wakandans have so quickly, so often, and so strongly felt such an affinity with a girl they met only a few hours ago, so strongly indeed that they're prepared to have their country invaded and their queen drowned to save her. All I'll say about it for now is that this seems especially drastic, not because it's morally or logically indefensible to do any of this necessarily, but because it's drastic conditionally. Sacrificing high and political ideals in the name of love is a well-worn and admirable trope. Greater love hath no man than this, the Bible says, that a man may lay down his life for his friends. E.M. Forster once said that if given a choice between betraying his country or betraying his friend, he hoped he would have the guts to betray his country, and I consider both of these to be good and noble statements. But Iron Child isn't a friend in this sense. She's practically a complete stranger. The film has spent no time on her character or her relationships. Most people's capacity for self-sacrifice on the part of complete strangers is much less than it is on the part of good friends. If the Wakandans' actions with respect to Iron Child seem unduly drastic, then it's because the film hasn't given them anything worth dying for. Shuri continues all the same, saying their capital was destroyed, which it categorically was not. Bits of it got a bit wet, a palace window got smashed. Her plan to get back at Freaky Fish Guy is, and I quote, to bring Namor to us, by which she means luring him to, and I quote again, a distant location at sea. I am now beginning to doubt the plain meaning of words. Bring him to me is hard to reconcile with in a place far away. It's not impossible to reconcile. Essentially, she's setting the terms and the location of their engagement. But then, if you live in a landlocked African country miles from the coast, and you know your enemy is primarily water-based, if the only waterways into your kingdom are a limited number of rivers that will be too shallow and too narrow for attack whales and thousands of sea people to traverse, if you know that this is how the Freaky Fish people will have to approach your kingdom, and you know that they will be coming back in seven days by their own admission, why, in the name of Jeff Bezos's shiny head, would you voluntarily take your army into the ocean? Why would you not establish a position miles inland? Block your rivers, get some fucking beavers, defend your waterways to thin their numbers, and then meet them outside of their element. Why are you volunteering to go to the one place that is best for your enemy and worst for your own forces? Your tanks are fucking rhinos. Rhinos are not aquatic mammals. The Bacandans have a navy of armored hippos that can take on the Aztec's fleet of killer whales. How does Bacanda even have a navy? Through whose territory are you going to move all the troops the film still pretends the world knows nothing about? Why have you not told the Americans about any of this, given you now have absolutely no reason not to enlist their support in this fight? Ugh. The answer to all of this, by the way, is because shut up. We've got a film to finish. 
Mbaku asks whether they would be right to kill Freaky Fish Guy because his people believe he's a god. Shuri takes him aside and he explains that killing a god could risk eternal war, which is, to be fair, an interesting point. Though the obvious corollary is, but what if that god insists on wiping out everyone on earth? Also, because it's an interesting question, yep, highly doubtful we'll touch on that one again either, he says it's not what her mother would have wanted for her, and Shuri gives another impassioned and fairly well-performed spiel about her mother being dead and her dreams and hopes being dead as well. She, Shuri, wants Namor dead, and she demands that M'Baku help her achieve it. Once again, I see what the film is going for, and once again, it's a creditable trope when deployed accurately. The problem, as ever with this film, is that its character and world building are at odds with each other. Freaky Fish Guy's stated goal is global annihilation followed by global domination, including the end of Wakanda unless Wakanda bends the knee. It hasn't given us any way out for him. In fact, it's been quite careful in closing down any potential avenues for peace. That is kind of the point of the setup. Simultaneously, it seems to have attempted to build up Shuri's personal revenge motive in such a way that leaves us suspecting she might have cracked. The similarity with Freaky Fish Guy and with Kill... Killmonger? Killdozer? Why can't I remember his name? Killdozer? Killmonger. That one. And her angry and bitter response to M'Baku in this scene. They both invite us to read irrationality into her actions. Someone corrupted by desperate anger. Killmonger was right. We aren't so different, you and I. These two build-ups are fighting over the same conclusion. If they have no choice but to kill Freaky Fish Guy to end his evil plans, then Shuri's payoff struggles to find a place. Sure, she might be motivated by the wrong reasons, but the film has us thinking that her proposed solution is the right one. If she goes off to kill him based on what the film wants us to think is flawed reasoning, motivated by hatred and bitterness, well how can we regret her course of action if that's the only course of action that could prevent world war? One possible way out would have been to at least trail Freaky Fish Guy's persuadability to justify him climbing down at some later point. The problem is that to get us to where we are now, it's hard to portray him as utterly uncompromising, and the film has worked so hard to establish that that it's actually had to compromise on its sense-making faculties, as already discussed at some length. Freaky Fish Guy has been indissolubly focused on remaining hidden from the world, and then indissolubly bent on going to war with the same world which would reveal him. He didn't climb down from the first position, the writers just apparently forgot about it. He can't climb down from this position without retconning his personality and his motives a second time. The only outcome that makes sense is Freaky Fish Guy's death or his defeat with the promise of returning unbowed to try again. The only narrative choice available on the character level is for Shuri to switch her motives, for her to do the actually we are different you and I thing. That would fulfill her character arc, but it still amounts to very little narratively. A shift from killing you is the right thing to do but I'm doing it because I'm angry to killing you is the right thing to do but I now regret that I have to do it. Anything else would require a profound change in Freaky Fish Guy's character and motives that the film literally does not have time to trail in any way. Which inevitably means that's exactly what it will do and the film will end in the least satisfying way imaginable but we'll come to that in a moment. M'Baku relents and a motley collection of mostly spear-armed not gooed up Wakandan tribesmen board a Wakandan ship. Again, not a good plan, your enemies control the fucking water. Shuri and Nokia have a parting conversation which answers that point I raised a moment ago. Shuri says that she is already consumed by vengeance, it's her sole driving motive, or at any rate that's what she believes of herself. Honestly, with these ingredients the most interesting thing to do would be for her to actually be consumed by vengeance, and for the film to end on a massive downer. Freaky Fish Guy dead, but the Black Panther dead in spirit as well. Not all wounds can be healed. But this is a Marvel film, so... so nah. The Wakandans go off to the Atlantic in one big ship, most powerful nation in the world, and its army is a couple of dozen people on one ship. It only has one ship. It's a pretty big ship, and you have to wonder where the hell they've been keeping it for the many centuries of their existence where they had no business on the sea. And Freaky Fish Guy and his whale riding army go off to meet them. Incidentally, and to touch on this in a bit more detail, what is the Wakandans' reason now for not having formed the Americans and the rest of the world about what's going on? They had to remain stum to avoid war, then they had to remain stum to avoid Freaky Fish Guy from killing Shuri while she was in captivity. Now they are at war, and he doesn't have Shuri, and the war was the inevitable conclusion anyway, one of Freaky Fish Guy's motives was to remain hidden and unknown too, so unsuspected by, the rest of the world. The choice the Wakandans were presented with was, side with Freaky Fish Guy against the world, or side with the rest of the world against Freaky Fish Guy. They've made the latter choice, 
but the film doesn't seem to realize what that entails. Freaky Fish Guy has no hold over them anymore. They've made their choice, and it's against him. He has no leverage. He lost Shiri, he lost Iron Child, he poses a mortal threat both to Wakanda and to the rest of the world. The Wakandans are still suspected by the rest of the world for their involvement in the CIA's Atlantic incident, and they need to clear their name. So there's absolutely no reason for them not to tell the rest of the world now, and there is every conceivable reason for them too to tell the rest of the world now, given Freaky Fish Guy's ambitions are solely in their hands, and he has no hold over them that would prevent them destroying his dreams. The Wakandans would clear their name and salvage their international reputation. They'd bolster their pathetic one-ship navy and its small battalion of spear-wielding warriors with the combined might of the international community. Everyone in the West would put Wakandan flags in their Twitter bios, and the world economy would be boosted by arms sales from Raytheon, BAE, and Lockheed Martin. Wakandan soldiers could Pikachu dance on social media to drum up support. Cringy celebrities could recite poems on TikTok about Freaky Fish Guy's mother. I'm so sorry that I was not your mother. If I was your mother, you would have been so loved, held in the arms of joyous light. Never would the stories plight the world unfurled before our eyes, a pure demise of nations sitting peaceful under a night sky. Which would be very funny, given that he doesn't have one. There's no way the Aztecs could have survived this. I wouldn't be at all surprised to find the writers had political objections to having the Americans serve in any role that could be construed as rescuing the Wakandans, or that portrays them as the good guys. But I can think of no narrative reason for the Wakandans not to tell them, which is very shoddy writing. The Wakandan ship emits a sonic boom and forces Freaky Fish Guy's army to the surface, it having been established that they are very vulnerable to sonic weaponry. Will we see it again? Probably not. The Wakandans decloak and the battle kicks off, featuring Iron Child's incredibly silly looking Transformers getup. I'm sticking to my guns, by the way. I think I said it in part one. I got some flack for it, but I'm right. Transformers. No, shit, Gundam is better. Some of the Mer people decide they don't much mind the sonic boom after all, and so they disable it. Then they swarm up on the big Wakandan ship. On the subject of things we saw earlier that we'll never see again despite them being very useful in this exact scenario, the Mer people just kind of forget that they can lure their enemies into the water with their death song and decide a straight fight would just be much more fun. It would have been so simple to show the Wakandans putting in earplugs, and it would have taken just a few seconds to depict a failed attempt in a way that explains that power's absence from precisely the situation in which it would be most deadly. But, but nah, we've got loads of wire work to do and some CG and some stunts to cram in. There's not a huge amount to be said about the battle itself. It's bog-standard MCU stuff, lots of flying around, occasional lasers, not quite as weightless as the fight at the close of the first film, but not much weightier either. Probably the only way to redeem She-Hulk at this point is to go out of your way to prove that Jen Walters was right in her argument with Kevin about superhero endings. This fight has its share of extraordinary luck as usual, which is handy because the Wakandans' ludicrous plan to microwave Freaky Fish Guy in midair relies on it. Iron Child just happens to shoot him in the clouds at just the right altitude, at just the right moment, with just enough force to set him on just the right trajectory, at just the right speed, for just the right amount of time, to hit the pervaporation fighter. Yes, that's a thing. No, it shouldn't be, which arrives at just the right moment for him to very conveniently fall inside, meaning Shuri can go up and have a confrontation with him. Freaky Fish Guy, for his part, courteously waits until she reaches the fighter before he remembers he's actually still in the plot. Quick sidebar for any budding writers out there, characters do not just freeze when they're off screen. The world doesn't stop, save for the one bit you're depicting at the time. Events off screen move at the same pace as those on screen. Freaky Fish Guy has the time, while the ship descends low enough for Shuri to jump aboard, to bust his way out of the jet, or at least to begin trying to, but he doesn't. So Shuri plops into the ship. And the AI hopefully turns on the fucking microwave. Yes, yes, this really is their plan. It really is happening. And Freaky Fish Guy's first reaction to being trapped in a random fighter jet is not to punch his way through it, or to jump back out through whatever hole he came in. No, that wasn't the best choice of words in hindsight, but I've committed to it now so we'll have to see it through the bitter end. Anyway, instead, he waits until Shuri arrives. They have a quick chat, then he gets microwaved. He having been captured, the Wakandans decide to retreat back to Wakanda. Don't know how they're going to get there on this massive ship, given that they can't possibly go all the way up the river to Central Africa, but fuck it, who knows? However, inconveniently, but entirely predictably, it turns out they have no means of defending the underside of their big ship, 
which is one of the countless reasons coming out to sea for this fight was a spectacularly dumb decision. This means that one of the mer people can steadily smash a hole in the bottom and put a big bomb in it, which disables the ship. That, in turn, means that a huge bundle of water bombs can be towed toward it by some whales, which causes it to lean and some Wakandans to fall into the water. Not many of them mind, just a few of them, and this because, rather than bringing a ship with any weaponry on board, they all just stand on top of it, so they have an excuse to swing their spears around. Most powerful nation in the world facing rival to that title, but in what other conceivable military engagement would this tactic be useful? Most actual navies don't just stand men on top of their ships, so you can't just beat them by making the ship rock a bit. And that's apparently all the Aztecs can do. Oh, uh, anyway, not to worry, because Nokia and Michonne fly in on their suits and they cause trouble. In the Pavaporation ship, Freaky Fish Guy tries to use his Vibranium Spear to escape, and the AI tells us that for some reason this means that the ship could explode at any second. Shuri tells it to fly them into the desert that they should really have been in from the off, and then the ship does indeed explode. Just, just, just why? Why would you do any of this? Even accepting that you should have left Wakanda for the battle, which you definitely fucking shouldn't. Why wouldn't you have made the desert your base of operations? Why wouldn't you attack from the desert? Why couldn't you use Talakan's location, which Nokia knows, to send drones down or missiles down to smoke them out, lure them into the desert, fight from a position of strength? The entire battle plan was devised solely because the writers wanted a sea battle. There is no tenable in-universe reason for it, they just wanted it to happen, so they contrived their way to making it happen. Absolute joke-level writing. So now we get two fight scenes to track. The one on the big ship and the one in the desert. Michonne vs. Head Fish Guy and Iron Child v. Some Mermaid Bint in the first instance, Shuri vs. Namor in the second one, which is all tedious and predictable. It's not only the setup that's repetitious, it's the rhythm of the fight scene. You already know that the heroes will be winning, then something will go wrong. In this case, Shuri gets stabbed by Freaky Fish Guy's spear right through the gut, and then everything will slow down and look desperate for a while. And then you'll have a moment of awakening for the hero. In this case, Shuri somehow surviving and insta-healing in a manner that would make Obi-Wan's Space Moses jealous, followed by some flashbacks, and then a standoff between the hero and the villain. And then things will turn out in our hero's favor after all. Albeit here, the last couple of steps are slightly tweaked, because in this telling, Freaky Fish Guy just happens to be walking in the direct line of one of the destroyed evaporation ship's engines, which is somehow still functioning despite it being a complete wreck, and which Shuri appears to be able to activate using a wrist computer, which causes it to emit a burst of fire that hits Freaky Fish Guy in the back and knocks him down. They, um, <clears throat> they, they, they dried his back. I have elected not to make that joke. Shuri, who is now absolutely fine, stands over him with his spear in hand, and we get a long sequence of flashbacks in reverse, jumping between the events of her past and the events of his. And then Queen Ramonda Valerian appears to her in a vision, and Shiri has her moment of moral awakening in the end. She demands that Freaky Fish Guy yield in return for Wakanda's protection, which he won't because he's a moral fanatic, a committed genocider, a single-minded, so he accepts her offer, and it's all cool. Then, both of them immediately recover from their injuries. They fly over the battlefield, standing on a ship together, and announce that they're friends now. Just really? That's, that's what you've gone with? That's nonsense. But we'll come back to it in a moment. Because, no, well, well wait, that's it? We're wrapping up now? That's basically the end of the film. Shuri and Iron Child have a chat. It turns out they're going to let Iron Child go home, but she has to leave the suit behind. Why? Sh she can surely make it again herself. She can make another vibranium detector herself. Why the hell would Namor have agreed to this? What? No. And Shuri also agrees to replace Iron Child's muscle car. We get Shuri's coronation ceremony on top of the waterfall, except that she doesn't turn up, and M'Baku emerges from the plane and says that he wants the challenge for the throne. Over in Talakan, Freaky Fish Guy and his cousin, whose name is Namora, or is it Namora? No, Namora. Must be Namora. Namor and Namora. Mm hmm. Anyway, they have a slightly sinister chat in which she is revealed to not like this new settlement, but he says that Shuri's compassion for Talakan might one day prove useful suggesting that I might have been right earlier about little changing in the outcome from Shuri's moral awakening, but they'll save the consequences for a later film. And then we cut to Bilbo as a prisoner being transported in a van, which comes across a fallen tree and stops. 
and Michonne pops up and rescues him. She says, a colonizer in chains, now I've seen everything. Except of course that he's American, and he wasn't alive hundreds of years ago, and Wakanda was never colonized. I'm going to come back to this in a moment as well. Shuri, it turns out, has buggered off to Haiti to meet Nokia, where she finally gets to complete the ritual that was aborted when Freaky Fish Guy staged his first intervention in Wakanda's internal affairs. She has elected to be the Black Panther but not the Queen. This prompts flashbacks of she and T'Challa, which is tasteful enough I suppose, and she has a cry, and that's the end of the film proper. All that's left is the mid credit scene where we learn that Nokia and T'Challa had a secret son in Haiti who they kept away from the pressures of rulership and that Ramonda knew all about it, actually so there. And that is the end of the film. How to sum up. Let's kick off with the good. The meme is that current Marvel film is the best Marvel film since the last Marvel film. In this case, that is probably true. Narratively and tonally, Wakanda Forever is maybe half a grade above Thor Love and Thunder. It's probably a few grades above it, actually. It doesn't treat every sentence as a joke. It has the intelligence of a mentally stunted millennial rather than a mentally stunted Zuma. In having a plot that in places adds up and in not completely destroying the known laws of the universe, it's also better, I think, than Multiverse of Madness. Really, it's hard to tell these apart. They are so close together. You could just swap these three around and I would probably find a good argument for your list, but no, I'm going to say it's slightly better than the two preceding. The soundtrack is creative enough. It usually avoids being intrusive with a couple of notable exceptions. It features some fairly strong performances in the main from Queen Ramonda and Shuri. The in-universe suffering possibly conveys the real-world sense of loss I don't doubt many of the cast felt at the death of Chadwick Boseman. It managed for the most part to avoid funeral kitsch, never mind funeral porn, making for an homage and a dedication that was, if not at all subtle, then at least not offensively crass. It occasionally remembered that morals are a thing that characters should have an experience, even if it only selectively remembered them, and in displaying a basic understanding of cause and effect, you could at least see how events followed events, again with some notable exceptions. It is staggering that something so elementary should need to be pointed out for praise, but that's the world we now live in. Of the bad, there is inevitably much more to say. Wakanda is a memeable entity because, as I've had to say time and time and time again, it makes no fucking sense. It's a kind of perverse achievement that the MCU's now created a faction that makes less sense than Wakanda, and that it's done so by destroying one of the few solid rules established by the first Black Panther film. Wakanda Forever has no understanding of consequences as regards the rules of world building. In the first film, it was comically absurd that a magical meteor should land and produce the world's most durable and valuable metal in functionally unlimited supply, and also a magic flower that produced magic goo that, if taken, could cure all illnesses and imbue a person with superpowers. Taken together, the entire edifice of Wakanda is constructed on contrivance. How is it so advanced? Vibranium. How is its technology capable of pretty much anything, like anal beads that serve as communicators, and also grenades, and also healing tools? Well, that's, that's vibranium and goo. Why don't all Wakandans get to take the goo? A good question, because my culture? Why can't they take it in future? Well, we at least solved that problem by having Killmonger burn all the flowers, meaning the substance might have been unlimited in its potential, but that unlimited potential and its world-breaking connotations had at least been safely compartmentalized away from the world they might break. A rule has been established that stops Wakandan nonsense trading on the MCU's world markets. A terrible film at least limited the damage it could do to those that came around and after it. But Wakanda Forever has broken that one rule, and so all the sense that stemmed from it. Wakanda is no longer the only source of vibranium or the flower or the magic goo. How many other meteors landed? Don't know. How widespread is the Aztec's vibranium deposit? Don't know. Why had nobody discovered it before now? Don't know. Now the CIA know roughly where to find it, why haven't they gone back to try and look for it? Don't know. Why does it turn Aztecs into fish and Wakandans into strong men? Don't know. Why does it turn Freaky Fish Guy into a jellyfish with wings on his heels? Mutant. Now Shuri's been able to create synthetic blue goo and potentially mass produce it, will they give it to all the Wakandans and even to the rest of the world to cure the vast majority of known causes of death and completely transform the world? Probably not. They could but they won't is not an acceptable answer, given not doing so would make them the biggest c in the long, sorry history of c -dom. You can't overstate the consequences of that reveal, yet we're lucky if the film even acknowledges the questions have been raised, such as when Michonne poses the 
How did the Aztecs get vibranium conundrum? Most of the consequential world building questions are never even raised in the film, and absolutely none of them are answered for. Again, the closest we get to an answer to any of them is Michonne complaining that the fairy tales she heard as a kid might not be true. This is not the first thought that would have come into my mind if I just discovered that the entire basis of my society had been shattered. If Wakanda makes no sense, the Aztecs make less. They multiply the dumb fuckery of the goo by expanding its range of seemingly arbitrary effects. Unlike the Wakandans, they have never taken the trouble to turn their vibranium into anything remotely approaching technology, with the exception of their breathers, their spears, and possibly, but not certainly, their underwater city. No attempt was made to conceal Talakan, or even to guard its approach beyond its naturally secretive location, down where it's wetter. Wakanda, being land-based, would be much easier to stumble across by accident, hence the trouble they go to to conceal themselves and guard their borders. Talakan has a high degree of natural concealment, yet that high degree of natural concealment went all but entirely out of the window centuries ago, when oil prospecting and submarine exploration became the favored pastime of capitalists, scientists, and board film directors. They are more jealous of their privacy than even the Wakandans, yet took no additional steps to conceal what was a more naturally concealable home, preferring instead the world war option that wasn't the plan, until it was, right up until the point at which it wasn't again. This ties questions of world building plot and character motivation together, because Freaky Fish Guy's plan is, and always was, incomprehensible, and it's what supposedly shapes and determines much of the plot. He wants to kill Iron Child because she alone could build a vibranium detector that could potentially reveal his nation to the world. He wants to do that before he launches a world war that would reveal his people to the world. He forces them to kidnap Iron Child and hand her over so he can kill her in aid of the first goal, then, when it turns out that they don't kill her after all, he tries to use Iron Child as a bargaining chip to get Wakanda on side as an ally in his invasion of the world, which again would have revealed himself. Then, he insists that Iron Child must die, then he doesn't much mind if she lives or dies, as long as Wakanda joins his fishman in going to war with the world. The alternative is war with Wakanda, which would reveal his people to the world. The Wakandans don't tell anyone about him in case he invades and reveals himself to the world, yet when the option presents itself, he keeps Iron Child alive and in captivity for no discernible gain while he negotiates with Shuri the most destructive way to ensure their mutual revelation to the world. Then, the Wakandans voluntarily go to war with someone whose driving motive is that he doesn't want to be revealed to the world, and they choose not to reveal him to the world despite having every reason to do so, and no disincentive from doing so. After their final confrontation, Freaky Fish Guy relents and accepts Wakanda's protection, using Wakandan stealth tech to ensure that he remains hidden from the world his first goal once again, which option only makes sense if the world war was purely optional and his only unconditional motive was remaining hidden from the world. In which case, given both he and the Wakandans had a powerful shared interest in ensuring his vibranium deposit wasn't discovered, they could have struck this bargain to their mutual benefit, forged a strong, peaceful and profitable alliance, and avoided the entire nonsensical mess that followed at their first meeting at the beginning of the film. The only reason that wouldn't have worked is if he was fanatically committed to the world war, which he wasn't until he was, right up until the point at which he wasn't again. That the CIA already has a fix on the likely location of his vibranium and Bilbo has already suggested to the CIA that another nation might be out there are two more questions that are too inconvenient for the film to bother addressing. Bilbo is simply sent to prison, and that's it. The Americans are an ever-present threat to Wakanda in this film. The film opens with their deteriorating relations, it reminds us often of their presence, of their desire to move in on Wakanda following T'Challa's death. And then, for the final act, they just disappear. They do nothing. Nothing comes of the knowledge they have, or their threats of invasion and destabilization. They cease to exist as far as the plot is concerned. There's no payoff to that entire arc. It's the narrative equivalent of a ruined orgasm. And the Wakandans have shot themselves in the foot. That's a mixed metaphor. Can you shoot? No, it's not. I guess if you shoot yourself in the foot, it would ruin an orgasm. Anyway, the Wakandans have shot themselves in the foot because by not telling the Americans, the Americans still suspect that they were behind the attack on the CIA and the Atlantic. So, actually, the Wakandans have voluntarily left themselves in a significantly disadvantageous position compared to the one they had every incentive of manufacturing. It's almost as if the film makes no sense. The stakes shifting constantly makes the plot less obviously absurd than Love and Thunder or Multiverse of Madness, but not much less nonsensical in its own right. Character motives explain character actions, which in turn form the basis of the plot. They are the reasons things happen the way they do. 
If these foundations are unstable, the resulting creation is liable to collapse under the slightest bit of pressure or the first hint of questioning. Where there are self-evidently better, simpler and more peaceful and profitable options that characters could have taken but didn't, that they could have repeatedly taken and repeatedly didn't, then you need sincere and almost fanatical motivation to the alternative to explain why that worst option was taken. If those motivations don't exist, or if they change easily, you don't have recourse to the insanity plea, and the simpler, better and easier options are then only avoided because otherwise there wouldn't be a film? As I said on my other channel, if you only have characters doing plausibly dumb shit because otherwise you wouldn't have a plot, your plot is built on contrivance, not on sensible writing. This is especially true of Freaky Fish Guy, as we've discussed at some length. Because the film evidently wanted to close on sequel bait, it felt it necessary to create what must turn out to be a false peace between the Wakandans and the Aztecs. Leaving aside the nonsense of the final battle and the pervaporation plane plan, the great narrative issue with the non-climax is precisely that. It was a non-climax. These weren't two long-battling foes who fought each other to exhaustion and a reluctant impasse. These were two enemies who met a couple of days ago, who didn't need to be enemies, who became mortal enemies later not at the moment of Ramonda's death, though that was the triggering event, but from the moment the film switched Freaky Fish Guy's motives for no adequately explored reason. They became mortal enemies from the moment he decided he was and had always been set on the course of global destruction and domination. Yet this is not a plan that should end with a false peace, and his is not a character who should have accepted it. Shuri's change of heart at least forms part of an intelligible arc, even if she's far too quick to elevate Freaky Fish Guy to the position of official ally rather than a defeated subject. I don't think the moment of them flying together proclaiming peace in our time can be excused by her naivety as established in the film since a significant part of her arc involves her loss of that same innocence and naivety. If the idea was to show her tacitly accepting M'Baku's advice against killing someone his people believed to be a god, because that could risk eternal war, the film did an appalling job of framing it in that way, it made no attempt to justify it, and in any event we'd be left to ask just what the risk of said eternal war actually is. Given this mighty army of fish people could be fended off by one ship and a few dozen Wakandan soldiers. You can make a decent sequel premise from this raw material, but the film doesn't seem especially aware of the fact. In the event, we have Freaky Fish Guy accepting an offer he should have made at the beginning, but should not have accepted at the point he actually accepts it, if he is to remain in character, and Shuri elevating him well above the station his actions warranted. The underlying political message is quite possibly supposed to convey indigenous solidarity against the white westerners, which is a point we might come back to presently, but quite apart from that being a pretty ugly message, it lends itself to this unsatisfying conclusion. Put simply, the film bigged this up to be a final confrontation and turned it into a damp squib. Its characters don't appear to have been written with this type of ending in mind. The plot begged for a conclusion, not for an interlude. Of the remaining characters, there's not a huge amount to add. The film deserves praise for Ramonda's portrayal and Angela Bassett's performance, likewise for making a good fist of a difficult job in elevating Shuri to T'Challa's old role, which it handled quite sensitively and without recourse to a cliché and triumphalist end. That hers is a character that could still be taken in interesting and thoughtful directions is evidence that, at the very least, the film didn't fuck her up. Praise is warranted too for M'Baku, who managed to lighten the mood without recourse to generic MCU cut-and-paste humour. In a slate of films that have been largely lifeless, it is nice to get a glimpse of a character who is larger than life. He's seldom present for long, but he does tend to steal his scenes and his emergent fatherly relationship with Shuri adds some much-needed warmth to the film. The lasting disappointment, not counting Freaky Fish Guy, who we have thoroughly pervaporated by this point, has to be Riri Williams, filling in the Hugo Chavez role of stock figure slash McGovern. As we've said, both Wakanda Forever and Multiverse of Madness introduced new heroes as mere props or devices, forgetting their characters completely. Chavez and Williams make Kate Bishop's introduction in Hawkeye seem like a masterful deployment by comparison of what can be a creditable device, introducing new heroes under the aegis of the old. The problem with the first two of these is, again as pointed out on my second channel, that they've been thrown into films with no capacity to nurture them. Films where so much stuff is happening, where so many people are present, where the stakes are so incomprehensibly vast, and where the story makes no fucking sense whatsoever, so that no time can actually be spent allowing these new entrants to grow into their roles. I get that the MCU needs to think about a refresh, about restocking its roster, 
but its typical approach seems to be throwing them into stories that don't especially need them, presumably in a bid to fast forward their emergence beyond the first introductory steps. This approach will come back to bite in the medium term, because eventually these new characters will be expected to play a much larger role, but we've been denied the chance of any meaningful introduction to them. It's not enough to say that the MCU now has important female figureheads because these figureheads are empty vessels without character or a relationship with the audience. Nobody gave a shit when Captain Carter died in Multiverse of Madness. Everyone gave a shit when Captain America left the scene. Sex and gender has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with character. Chavez and Williams are no more fleshed out than Captain Carter was in her cameo, and we have no more reason to care about them than we did about her. Finally then, a meta observation. I get my political jibes in during the course of these reviews. I like to think it's mostly mean-spirited, but it's all in good fun. They are, in any case, almost exclusively reactionary jokes in their nature. If there is political subtext, or straightforward political text in any film or TV show or work of literature, the politics of same are fair game. Criticizing the injection of politics is not, in and of itself, a positive political statement. Criticizing forced diversity, or the sledgehammer to the face of gender politics, does not axiomatically make you a conservative, a republican, or even a right-winger. I tend to think it makes you merely a connoisseur of art for art's sake. Whether this closing point strays over a line into politicking of my own, I'll let you be the judge. It might well do, I'm not going to run away from the suggestion if you think that it does. But I think it's important to say, and so, say it, I shall. The first Black Panther film was, as I said at the top of the first video, deemed a cultural moment, and I think from the reaction to it that it would be churlish to deny that that is what it amounted to. But not all cultural moments are good, and not all the entailments of cultural moments are to be welcomed. Wakanda as an entity, as a premise, is an avowedly political thing. Its formulation, its foundation, its relationship with the wider world are implicit political statements, off the back of which a number of explicit political statements are often made. I am more sympathetic to the notion of representation in art than I think much of my audience is. Not much more sympathetic to it, but I am a bit more sympathetic to it. I think it is important, especially to young people, that they are able to see on screen or on the page those who are in the ineffable ways like them. That is not to say, as some people try to say, that if you are a white person looking at a black character or a black person looking at a white character, you can't sympathize or empathize with them at all. It is, though, to say that there is something just a little bit extra. Art, in the Aristotelian conception, performs a cathartic purpose. It's a kind of bloodletting for the emotions. You can lessen the very real psychological trials and tribulations, the fear that comes from, for example, growing up gay or bi, or as the one black kid in your class, if you have artistic outlets depicting people who are just like you, who go through the things you go through and have many of the same fears and doubts and who overcome them. It's all very well saying, well, black people had Blade, but it's not for anyone but you to say which characters you resonate with, which mean something to you, which you love, whose stories you inhabit. So to the extent young black kids watched the first Black Panther film and felt empowered and inspired by it, so much the better. But what matters is at least as much the ends to which this inspiration is put, and the baggage it is or isn't attached to. There is a difference between a personal attachment to a character and exclusionary attachment to an ideal. The best examples of those inspirational characters of the type I've set out above speak to you individually, but their message is still universal. Anyone can love them and be inspired by them in their own ways, and your personal inspiration forms part of a much larger whole. This is a way of bringing outcast peoples and groups into the artistic society, emphasizing how each and every one of us is an individual but fits into something greater than ourselves and showing the strength that results from alloying ourselves as individuals to that grander place, purpose, and sense of belonging. Wakanda, conceptually, and as depicted both in the first Black Panther and in Wakanda Forever, is a different proposition. One of the reasons it's so difficult to fit the nation into the broader realm of the MCU is that the philosophy underlying its depiction is one that is uneasy and sometimes outright hostile to the very idea of universalism. It's no coincidence that Black Panther comics have been turned over to the kind of radical and exclusionary strand of black separatist and black nihilist thought as represented by the likes of ta -Nehisi Coates. The films bear many of the hallmarks of that strain of black intellectual thought as well. The notion that Wakanda is only great because it never assimilated or engaged with the outside world plays on the anti-colonialist myth that all was as heaven 
until white westerners showed up, bringing with them various strains of original sin. Conceptually, Wakanda is a segregationist idyll. Leave us alone and we will prosper. Our neighbors are poor because they let you in. The fact that Wakanda's premise is in an alarming number of ways indistinguishable from the presence of apartheid South Africa is one of those things that you're really not supposed to point out. The premise displays a distinctive and unpleasant blend of the chaotic, the fatalistic, the vengeful, and the hypocritical, hence the vast number of unanswerable questions about the place. Why, for example, does such a wealthy and powerful nation not alleviate the suffering of its neighbors? Why does it not cure diseases it alone can treat, provide food it alone can grow, empower its continent by the technology it alone can produce? It's an example of the fictional playing notes transposed from a real-world ideology. Black Marxists, black separatists, anti-colonialists, and black supremacists in the real world, and almost exclusively in America, believe the world was destroyed by the original sin of white westerners, and cannot account for the fact that that same western world has objectively done more to alleviate poverty, starvation, and disease than the most fervently anti-imperialist and isolationist African nation ever could, including those that were never colonized, which are invariably much poorer and more destitute than those that were. This is an ideological strain almost unique to African-American intellectuals and their white left-wing supporters, and it's born of their unique and tragic history, which is indeed full of much injustice. As W. H. Auden famously wrote, I and the public know what all school children learn, those to whom evil is done do evil in return. But by clinging to this creation myth, with its obsessive focus on original sin and externalized injustice, it perpetuates its own condition. For all the history of black America is full of tragedy and torment, it is also full of liberation, affluence, education, fulfillment, and safety, all of which must be overlooked in order to cling to the Wakandan ideal that blacks must be separate to be truly free. It's unpopular among the intellectual class when you point this out, but America and Britain in particular are the best places in the world to be black. The total household wealth of African Americans exceeds the GDP of every single African nation. Indeed, it exceeds the total GDP of the vast majority of countries in the world as a whole. African Americans are more free of crime, murder, discrimination, and almost every other kind of injustice than minorities in any part of Africa are. Attempting to externalize the source of all your ills, as in various Wakandans' use of the term colonizer to describe various white Americans, which I've noticed bleeding into the real world as well, isn't always consciously vindictive, but it all contributes to the myth that black segregationists peddle. That Wakanda itself was never colonized, and no American alive today was ever a colonizer, is proof of how lazy ideological frameworks bleed into art. The term makes no sense in the context in which it's deployed. It only makes sense out-universe, in the ears of an audience that is being told, time and again, across so much media, like an incantation, that society can be neatly divided into oppressed and oppressor, victim and victimizer, colonizer, and colonized. This is the reason Black Panther's cultural moment is, I think, to be regretted. Many of its underlying assumptions are toxic, its messaging is exclusionary, and activist ideals are snuck into the collective consciousness via the medium of popular art. To say that this is just pop culture is to miss the point. It's not just pop culture, it is pop culture. If you think that there's a hard divide between what you see on your screen and what the audience will come to believe, you are flatly naive. One of the permanent ironies of the activist class is that by agitating along the lines they do, they tend to increase the prevalence of the thing they are agitating against. That's why messaging like this in films like Black Panther are to be regretted. In Black Panther as a character, though, there was the prospect of redemption. Here was a man of that place who suffered loss and injustice, who embodies many of these unpleasant ideals, but who, like the best heroes, transcends them finds a way to accommodate his personal experiences in a wider world in a positive and integrationist way. His opening up of Wakanda at the close of the first film didn't undo all the damage of its messaging, didn't let all the poison from the veins, but it did at least offer a positive outcome, an ultimately inclusive message of mutual accommodation, understanding, and empowerment. I wonder then if it isn't telling, and in its own way it's symbolic, that Wakanda forever lacked that sentiment entirely. Returning to themes of differentness and exclusion and distrust, and ending with a theme of indigenous solidarity against what the film tacitly accepted was a hostile world divided between us, the noble savages, and them, the cynical western oppressors. 
it may then be, that the greatest loss to culture bought by Chadwick Boseman's death was, in fact, the death of his character and the death of his symbol, after all. And on that morose and foreboding note, we have reached the end of this video. Next up on this channel will either be Rings of Power Part 3 or Avatar The Last Smurf Bender. I would hazard a guess and say Avatar just because, well, those Rings of Power videos are damned long and I've got a lot of work to do on it. The other channel in the meantime will have a few more short reviews going up. I've uploaded a positive one on Andor quite recently. I might also have time to praise House of the Dragon and if I can, I will track the sorry but hilariously sorry story that is Willow. My colleague continues to work away on his channel where he's recently mounted a defense of good bad films that completely failed to make me respect him for liking Godzilla vs Kong. And he likewise continues to scribble away on his substack. Links for all of this, as well as some excellent channels that you should really check out, are in the description. Do please give them a watch, a like, a subscribe. And there's a Patreon link as well if anyone fancies making my stab at full-time YouTubing stand a greater chance of success. See you in the next video. Good night.